Hi everyone, this is Divya from Quick Mommy Hacks and today we'll talk about a very interesting topic, how babies learn language. And for that, I have Dr. Jenny Safran with us today. So Dr. Jenny Safran, she has been on the faculty of the University of Wisconsin-Madison since she received her PhD from University of Rochester in 97. Her research program focuses on how infants learn, particularly in the domain of language. Dr. Safran's scholarship bridges developmental psychology, cognitive psychology, perception, psycholinguistics, and communication disorders. She has a lab at University of Madison called Infant Learning Lab, which has been continuously funded for over two decades. She's a highly engaged teacher, a mentor to students at all levels, and she's also the recipient of numerous awards, including the Jeffrey Elman Prize for Scientific Achievement and Community Building by Cognitive Science Society. She was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2015, and she was also present in the Netflix documentary called Babies. Hi, Dr. Safran, how are you? It's really good to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to, to have a chance to talk with you. So I'll start with my first question, which is at what age do babies uh, start learning their native language? So even before they're born, while they're still fetuses, there's learning happening. But the learning inside the uterus is pretty basic stuff. The fetus can perceive aspects of the rhythm of what their mother is saying. So just the sort of ups and downs, the beat of the speech, that's about it. Um, but after they're born, babies start learning about the sound structure of their native language or languages um, really from the get-go, pretty much as early as we can study them. So how exactly do they acquire their native languages? Well, that's a question that I don't think we'll have a full answer for for many decades to come. There's a lot of learning that has to go on. As you and your listeners probably know from trying to learn um, additional languages in adolescence or adulthood. Um, but during the first year, a lot of the work that babies are doing really is about sound. So they're starting to figure out which sounds are in their native language. So which consonants and vowels are part of their language. Um, they can't produce them, but they're learning which ones to expect in their language. And then they're starting to figure out how sounds combine in their native language. So which sounds tend to go together, which sounds don't tend to go together. Um, and that allows them to begin binding sounds to meanings um, mm -hmm. at that very early phase of word learning, which does start um, somewhere around six months of age, if not a little bit earlier. Okay. So long before mm -hmm. they're producing language, they're understanding mm -hmm. little bits of it. So do they get like more of their language cues from the mom or, you know, the primary caregiver? They learn from whatever data they have access to. Um, so okay. they will learn from, um, well, when they're a fetus, they're getting it from the mom because they can't really hear anything else. Um, all they're yeah. hearing are sounds internal to the, the womb. Um, after birth, they'll learn from whatever is in their environment. So it could be a parent, it could be another caregiver, it could be a childcare provider, all of those things. Wherever the data okay. comes from, that's who they learn from. So in terms of language learning, what are the different stages? Well, we can distinguish between understanding and producing. So mm -hmm. producing a, if, as a parent, it's a lot easier to see, right? You can kind of tell, oh, my baby is cooing. They're making sounds like ooh, 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 very early on or sound like very early on. Then they start to babble, ba, 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 ga, 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 ga. Babies all over the world do that. Babies who are learning sign languages babble with their hands. This is happening somewhere around six months of age. And then the first word happens around on average 12 months. For some babies, that's earlier. For other babies, it's later, mm -hmm. often significantly later. That's production. For comprehension, it's a little bit harder to know exactly what they're learning, but we think that they start out, it's not really stages, it's all kind of happening in a very dynamic way, but they're starting out, as I said, with the sounds of their language, with the sort of music of their language, then they're starting to map meanings onto those sounds or signs if they're learning a sign language. That's all happening in the second half of the first year. And then it really starts rolling in the second year where babies start to learn words at a much more rapid clip. 
Uh, they start to understand a large number of words often by the end of their second year, and they start to understand aspects of the grammar of their mm -hmm. language. So how those words combine, again, sometime later in the first year into the second, um, probably actually I should rephrase that, probably sometime in the second year, and then getting really good at understanding grammar into the third year. So basically they are learning actually throughout the time, just by the data that is available to them. That's right. And so are we. I mean, we never stop learning. Um, we're always yeah. learning language. But when you're a baby, you're starting from zero. So you have a lot yeah. more to learn. Um, yeah. And then as you get older, you're sort of fine tuning that based on the data yeah. that, that's coming in. So do they mostly like learn through your lip movement or mostly is it like hearing based? Um, well, it's if you are a baby who can see and can hear. Um, so uh, if you have access to both of those modalities, then it's both. Um, babies are actually integrating the, what they're seeing on the face with what they're yeah. hearing in speech. Um, there's a lot more information in sound than, than the face though. If you watch mm -hmm. someone talk, even as, a, even as an adult, so if we turned off my audio right now and you just looked at me, you wouldn't have any idea what I was saying. Um, yeah. So the mouth doesn't provide, it provides some data, but not as much data as your ears do. Um, if you're a blind baby, you learn, we believe that you learn um, spoken language at the same clip as a hearing baby, uh, as a sighted baby. So you're able to use all that audio stuff and you don't need the face. And then babies who are deaf um, are actually much much more facile at learning sign languages, at learning languages on the mm -hmm. hand, because of what I just said, there's just not that much data on the mouth mm -hmm. that would tell you the difference. I mean, if the difference between bat and pat, it's really easy to hear, it's really subtle on my mouth. Um, so yeah. that's hard. So is there any data which suggests any evidence, you know, which suggests that boys or girls, you know, they learn languages differently? It's a great question. There's we don't really know about differently. There's a little bit of data, both from experiments and also from uh, more standardized measures that girls are a little quicker uh, to learn their native language. Um, and most measures we would see probably girls outstripping boys on average, there's not gonna be a lot of range, on average a little bit. Uh, some of that might be because boys are much more likely to have developmental disabilities than girls are. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the rates of different developmental disabilities that impact language learning, like autism or um, language disorders, um, they're more likely to be seen in boys. So some of that mm -hmm. difference could just be due to undiagnosed uh, language disorders, but on average, yes, girls are a little bit quicker than boys. Mm -hmm. So how can parents facilitate uh, this language development process? I mean, does baby talk help? Well, so the most important thing parents can do is give their children an environment that has lots of language in it. And that's something we naturally do as humans. Um, when we're around babies, we talk to them. It's You don't have to try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just something we naturally do. Um, in terms of, so we don't have to do anything special is what I'm trying to say. But mm -hmm. if babies don't hear language, if they're not around people interacting with them, they're not gonna learn. You need data to learn from. Um, in terms of baby talk, so we can distinguish between the music of how we talk to babies. We call this infant directed speech. Um, mm -hmm. And we see it all over the world. When we talk to babies, we tend to go slower and higher pitch and bigger changes in our pitch. We see that all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. That actually does seem to draw babies' attention. They prefer listening to talk like that than to talk mm -hmm. like what I'm doing right now. And in experiments, we see that babies learn a little bit faster from talk that's okay. very rich in this pitch. Um, but by baby talk, some people mean also like gaga, goo goo kind of stuff. And there again, you have to think about the data you're giving the baby. If you want the baby to learn your native language, then you have to talk yeah. in your native language. And gaga, goo goo isn't your native language. So I think the answer to your mm -hmm. question is yes, in terms of the musical way we speak to babies. And again, we see this all over the world in cultures that are incredibly diverse. Um, but in terms of like special you know, gaga goo goo stuff, 
it's not going to hurt them, but it's probably not going to like mm -hmm. teach them words mm -hmm. because it doesn't have words in it. So you suggest that parents should uh, talk, you know, in proper words to their babies, but it could be more in the form of like this uh, singing kind of voice that you said. To be honest, I think the parents should do what comes naturally to them. Um, mm -hmm. Babies really are incredibly good at figuring out how language works. Um, and I think parents have enough stress right now. And so I, um, I think if parents are feeling always worried when they're with their baby, am I talking enough? Will my baby not get into college because, you know, mm -hmm. I'm tired today and I'm not speaking in, yeah. you know, big fancy paragraphs. They don't need that pressure. Babies have been learning language as long as language has existed. They don't need flashcards. They don't need fancy games. They just need caregivers who love them and who want to engage with them. Um, that's, the, that's all that really matters. So I just want to elaborate a little bit on this topic because of course, like I personally tend to buy a lot of flashcards and a lot of, you know, those musical books, which are there, you know, which could you know, suggest that they could actually help baby learn the words and languages. So do you think that those kind of toys uh, help or, you know, it's just basically parents talking to the baby all the time. Is that like enough? You know, babies humans evolved in an environment that didn't have flashcards and didn't have electronic toys. Um, yeah. And uh, as long as as long as they're exposed to, you know, we do know from a fair amount of research now that babies are better at learning language from social interactions than mm -hmm. from screens um, or from yeah. uh, DVDs or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So so I think that, you know, it's a human interaction that's probably the best thing. Does that mean that yeah. it's bad to have your baby like, you know, in front of a screen now and then? No, like nothing in moderation is bad. Yeah. But these companies that make money by making parents anxious, um, yeah. <clears throat> I actually have kind of an ethical problem with that because there really isn't any data to support the idea that <clears throat> these products will actually help. They probably won't hurt. But parents yeah. aren't buying them because they won't hurt. Parents are buying them mm -hmm. because they think they'll help. And I think that's a, that's yeah. unethical on the part of these companies to try to make money off the backs of very anxious parents. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. no, I, I guess I add, like that's an yeah, sure. I was just saying, I wanted to add just one sort of additional thing though. A lot of babies are having more screen time these days because of the pandemic, yes. because they're interacting mm -hmm. over Zoom or Skype or whatever, FaceTime. Yes. Um, with family members and friends who are not present. And that's mm -hmm. great. There's actually evidence that babies do learn um, things like words um, almost as well, if not as well, from an interaction like you and I are having now yeah. as they do mm -hmm. from an in-person interaction. What really matters yeah. is the contingency so that the person yeah. on the screen is reacting to the baby, responding to the baby, having that back and forth, that sort of serve and return play uh, engagement. Um, babies can learn just fine from that. So, um, so I think, especially in these pandemic times when families aren't together or when families are spread all over the world, I think, you know, FaceTime and Zoom are amazing and I wish we'd had them when my kids were little um, and, you know, only saw their grandparents once a year. This, you know, this technology is wonderful. Yeah, so I didn't yeah. mean to critique the technology. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The critique is more about the companies that market it mm -hmm. as educational. So do you think early exposure to music can actually help with language development as well? So we know babies love music. It's probably the stimulus, maybe other than speech that they like the most. And mm -hmm. I think if you were to design the perfect data for babies, the perfect stimulus, it's actually infant directed singing. So singing that is directed to a baby, it has speech in it and music. And that's like, mm -hmm. babies love that. Um, but I don't think there's any evidence that exposure to music helps with language learning. Um, there's a little bit of, there's a debate in the literature about by the time children are preschoolers or in school age, does do music lessons and things like that help with things like learning to read? So there's maybe, there's an argument perhaps to be made a little bit older for music lessons, but the reason to play music for babies or to sing to babies is that they just yeah. love it. It's something that brings mm -hmm. them joy. It's engaging. It promotes bonding. Um, so I think it's a, a wonderful thing. And 
it speaks, your question speaks to this, the same yeah. point as the educational toys. We should do things that babies enjoy because they enjoy them, not because they're going mm -hmm. to necessarily promote, you know, some yeah. academic skill or help babies get into college or whatever. That's not the reason to do these things. Um, the reason yeah. to do these things is because babies love them and it's fun for caregivers. Um, I think caregivers really enjoy finding arenas that they and the baby both enjoy doing together. And I think music is probably at the very top of that list for most babies and caregivers. So uh, I guess like my next uh, question is regarding babies who are exposed to more than one language. Uh, so do you think that they can get confused if they are spoken to in more than one language? Not particularly. I think the data suggests that babies are extremely good even in that first year while they're just learning sounds, learning to understand yeah. language. They're very good at using probably the musical aspects of language to figure out, oh, that's language one. I'm going to put it over here in this box in my brain. Oh, that's language two. It sounds different. I'm going to put it over here in this box in my brain and then learning them separately. Um, and the evidence from experiments is that babies who are bilingual, they're not delayed in any way. If anything, it might, you know, if we're testing something that they might have learned at 12 months, if you're a monolingual baby, maybe they've learned it at 13 or 14 months. But if you think about how much more they have to learn, they have twice as yeah. much to learn, two languages. Yeah. And mm -hmm. here's the stunning thing for me, they have half as much data. Because if you're hearing two languages, if you imagine you're awake for uh, 10 hours a day, instead of having 10 hours of one language, you're gonna have five hours of one language and five hours of the other language. And yet they're doing it and they're not behind in any substantial yeah. way. So um, uh, I think bilingual exposure to, for babies is an absolute gift and something um, that should be really treasured and appreciated um, and not, uh, and not a, for, not a source of concern. Babies in most, maybe not most, I mean, the United States, as you probably know, is weird because so many people here are monolingual, but in most parts of the world, yeah. everyone is bilingual or trilingual um, and babies learn their languages just fine. So it's, it's more that the United States, or at least like a lot of pockets of the United States are just so bizarrely monolingual um, compared to most other yeah. countries, I think. Mm -hmm. So for babies who are, you know, learning more than one language, is there a way that parents should, uh, you know, facilitate that uh, learning process? Like mom should speak in one language or dad should speak in another language or something like that? I think the data suggests that doing whatever parents find natural is the best strategy. The problem with the one parent, one language approach, like on the one hand, it makes sense if you're trying to split up your data, you know, if yeah. mom is always doing language one and dad is doing language two, that's a cue that could tell you that they're separate. The problem is that in most families, the parents still talk to one another, right? And so it would be incredibly weird and unnatural for the parents to have parent one speak language one to parent two who responds in language two. That would just be really weird. Yeah. And in fact, there's been some very careful research looking at what parents actually do um, in Montreal, which is a heavily bilingual city. And I believe the data suggests that only 10% of bilingual families actually follow that strategy um, okay. reliably, even though a lot of people think they're doing that, but they're not really because the, they forget that the baby is collecting data from speech they overhear as mm -hmm. the parents talk to one another. They're not just learning mm -hmm. when you talk to them, they're learning from everything yeah. they overhear. Um, and those babies are all learning language just fine. So, um, so I would say to parents, um, again, do what comes naturally. Don't stress out about this. Um, babies are gonna, they'll, they're able to use the, again, these sort of musical aspects of language, the different accents of speech that they're hearing, the, dip, the way the different speech sounds sound to put language one in one box and put language two in another box and go from there. So I guess like, of course, like in bilingualism, there are lots of different myths that parents have sometimes. One of them is speech delays, which you already kind of clarified that that doesn't happen. So are there any other kind of myths that you wanted to address? Like, you know, which basically worry parents? 
So one thing that um, one notices when one interacts with bilingual children once they're speaking is a phenomenon called code switching, where the child will um, mix their two languages. And um, so if a child is learning English and Spanish, they might say like, you know, look at the gato or something like that. Um, parents do it too. <laughs> so that's part of how children learn it. Um, and so sometimes people worry that that suggests yeah. that there's a problem. But in fact, when you analyze, this is not my own work, but when researchers have analyzed the contents of children's code switches, the kids are doing something really smart, which is they're subbing in words from, let's say they're speaking in language one and they get to a concept that they don't yet have a word for in language one, they pop in language two. So they're actually doing something super smart, which is, um, essentially accessing the concepts um, in a very efficient way so that they can communicate. Um, and um, even though it sounds like they're confused, they're not um, probably uh, any more than their parents are who often are code switching mm -hmm. as well. That's really good to know because that ha happens a lot, at, at least like with adults as well. Uh, so I guess I'll move to language delays uh, in infants and toddlers. So what are the sign of speech or language delay in infants and toddlers? So the, the first thing to know is, so I, I alluded to this a little while ago, um, the first word, the first word produced happens on average around 12 months of age in spoken languages. Yeah. It's a little bit earlier in sign languages. It's around 10 months of age. Um, but when you think of an average, an average means that half the babies will be earlier and half the babies will be later. And so there's a huge amount of variability in those first productions of, of words. And so, um, you know, as a parent, if your child isn't producing words at 13 months, that's completely normal. That's completely within the range of what you might expect. Um, the thing that we often think about a lot is if a child isn't producing um, words by 18 months or two years, um, we might ask things like, um, how's their hearing? Um, because it's possible yeah. that part of why they might be a little bit delayed um, is they're not perceiving the sounds that they're hearing very well. Um, yeah. Another thing that we would ask is, do they seem to understand what they're hearing? Mm -hmm. Um, if they're understanding but not producing, then that's less of a concern. There are lots of reasons why babies might not be talking very much, but as long as they're understanding, that means they're learning. That means they're figuring stuff out. If they're not understanding words, you know, parents report that they're not understanding words by mm -hmm. 18 months or two years, that's where talking to a pediatrician is really important. Um, we might, uh, a pediatrician might ask, or speech and language pathologists might ask, uh, think about things like autism. They might ask if your child is pointing, um, does your child follow your gaze when you're, when you're pointing at something? Um, so at that point, that's where one would start to be a little bit more concerned. But in general, if a child seems to be understanding language just fine and is engaging in social interactions in a pretty typical way, um, then, uh, you know, there's this great old story um, about the child. Uh, it's probably not true, but the child who didn't talk until, you know, he was four. And one morning at the breakfast table, the child says, can you please pass the salt? And the parents are like, <laughs> oh my God, oh my God, you never talked before. Why didn't you talk before? And the kid says, until now, everything was fine. Um, <laughs> it's also the yeah. case that the majority of children who are late talkers will catch up and do just fine. Um, and there is a subset of children of roughly 7% of children um, in school age populations who do uh, evince evidence of a language disorder um, where they mm -hmm. have had difficulty acquiring their native language. But um, mm -hmm. it's pretty hard to diagnose these things until kids are you know, yeah. a couple years old. So with babies and toddlers, um, I would say, pay attention to whether your child seems to in, be engaged with you as you're talking, mm -hmm. pay attention to whether your child seems to understand some words. Um, and if they aren't, then it's a good idea to probably speak to a professional 
um, uh, your pediatrician is a good place to start and then a uh, uh, consult with a speech and language pathologist because it is the case that like most other developmental issues, um, early intervention is great. Um, yes. So if there is a concern, you know, catching it um, before the child reaches school is a really good idea. By school, mm -hmm. I mean like, you know, grade school. So catching mm -hmm. it, you know, you know, around age two or three is gonna be really helpful because there are lots of interventions and therapies that are that work really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see that all the time on social media and, uh, you know, some books and other places as well, that by this age, your baby should know these many words or like by this age, they should know these many words. So is there something like that, like a certain count of words that they should know at a certain age? No, um, because again, there's so much variability. Um, I wish I had thought to pull this up. There are great data, there are great databases where you can actually look at say what percent of children learning English seem to know this particular word at this particular age. There's huge variability. Um, but there's another bigger problem, which is how do you know if your child knows a word, right? And this yeah. is something we do in the lab. We can run experiments where we can ask whether a group of children understand certain words by mm -hmm showing them images on a screen and tracking their eye gaze as they hear words. So we can, we can look at that in the lab, but as a parent, I know for myself, when my children were little, yeah. um, you know, I had them in lots of research studies and I would have to fill out questionnaires about which words they knew. Um, and even for me, like being pretty knowledgeable in this area, I would be like, well, I think she knows the word cup, but I'm not really sure, or, well, mitten? maybe she knows that, but it's summer and, you know, she hasn't heard it in six months. So how would I know if she knows that word? It's, um, it's actually really hard to measure what yeah. words and how many words babies know. So that's another reason mm -hmm. to be really cautious of any claims about what babies should know, because even parents mm -hmm. don't really know what they know um, until we've done, we and other labs have done studies where we ask parents to fill out questionnaires about what babies they, what words they think their baby knows. And then we bring mm -hmm. them into the lab and we actually measure whether they know these words by looking at their eye movements as they hear yeah. words. And parents are often wrong. Um, so, <laughs> I would definitely take that sort of thing with a grain of salt. So I guess like the babies, uh, you know, we talked about delays. Uh, so the babies who are at a risk of language disorders or who have certain language disorders, how does the language learning process unfold in their case? Um, this is a really active area of research. Um, it probably depends in part on what the nature of their language disorder is and what's causing it. Um, but I, I, think, uh, I think that's a question we'll know a lot more about in another decade or so. The problem mm -hmm. has been that I think we've needed to do a lot of research with typically developing infants and toddlers to get a better sense of what that typical trajectory is, what sorts of data and learning processes the babies use. Um, and then we can hopefully look to see how those processes are disrupted. Um, but again, mm -hmm. it's probably gonna depend on sort of the etiology of the language disorder. And even within a diagnostic group, um, like take something like autism, some autistic children have a language disorder and some autistic children don't have a language disorder. Mm -hmm. So um, it's the answer to your question is uh, something I would, I hope to be able to say a lot more about in the next five to 10 years as, as we keep doing a lot more research with mm -hmm. children with uh, challenges in acquiring language. But I have actually read a lot about that, you know, if you feed your baby with a spoon or, you know, or like something like that, that how feeding is related to the speech development. Is that true, really? It doesn't really make any sense to me um, because, you know, how, how long does a baby spend feeding like with a solid food in a day, 20 minutes, 25 minutes? Yeah. I mean, how seems weird for that to have an effect. Um, but let's step back, even if it did, so what? Right? Like, I mean, I think this gets to this issue we've been talking about through this whole conversation, which is why does it matter if your kid learns to pr pronounce a certain sound a week before another kid? Who cares? Yeah. 
that are going to turn out just fine. Um, I, I think this sort of relentless pressure on parents yeah. to push, 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 push. It's, it's kind of sad. Um, you know, babies are only babies for a very short time. Um, so I just think our culture is really, really, really messed up. And I know there's a lot of competition, you know, parents want to get their kids into the best colleges and they want you know, all this stuff, but they're babies, enjoy them, play with them. They'll probably enjoy that empty paper towel roll more than they will the $20 electronic toy that, you know, someone just bought. Um, sing with them. Books are great. Um, that's actually one really good bit of parenting advice. I think um, you can get tired of talking to your baby because there's not that much to say. Like really, <laughs> like how much of a conversation can you have? And that's part of where books are really wonderful because they give you a way to provide language to your baby, to give them input, data to learn from that's really easy and fun and that they really enjoy. And there's some research out there that suggests that books actually, children's books, uh, baby books, um, can really expand children's vocabulary because they often will expose babies to words that they don't hear otherwise. Um, and this is particularly the case for babies um, who might be in environments where their parents, um, you know, are really busy or stressed and, you know, just can't give them that much language input, but books are really great. Um, so, you know, just finding ways to enjoy babies rather than viewing them as, oh, I got to get ahead, I got to get ahead, um, would be really, really, really good, um, I think. So I guess like all these are really, really great points. And just to end our conversation, if you had to sum up and, you know, say something to all the new parents who are often worried about the language development and as we are speaking about the competition part of it. So if you have like any last words of advice for them. My last words of advice are enjoy your baby, do what comes naturally, don't force it. Um, they're only going to learn language if they hear language or see language if they're learning a sign language. So, you know, they need that data to learn from. But if you're having a bad day or you're really stressed out about something, you know, it's okay. You don't have to make sure you talk to them for two hours a day, every day. They'll be fine. Um, babies have been learning language for millennia. They will keep learning language for millennia. Um, so just enjoy those really special first months and years because they won't come back. You won't have that experience again with your child. So enjoy it. That is absolutely true, actually. So yeah, I guess thank you. Thank you so much for being here and, you know, providing us with so much information. And of course, you know, it's really, really going to be very helpful for all the new parents. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Well, this brings me to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. If you like the video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Quick Mommy Hacks, and follow me on Instagram for some personal tips on pregnancy, childbirth, and motherhood. Also, do leave your feedback and feel free to ask questions in the comment section below.